S.C. Adugin's Washington Black, Understanding the Triangle Trade in Contemporary Caribbean Literature. Hope you really enjoyed this novel based around Barbados. While this novel appears not to be about the Caribbean, in many ways it is. Washington's evolution from an enslaved piece of property to a man correlates to the sudden and drastic changes that occurred during the first part of the 19th century all around the Caribbean through the abolition of slavery. Indeed, his story shows how quickly history moves and people change. We are reading this book as an example of contemporary Caribbean writing. Contemporary Caribbean writing tends to focus on the relationships between this region and the rest of the world. While the other periods of Caribbean literature, roughly what I classify as the colonial period, the national period, and the post-colonial period, focus on the development of voice, history, and culture in various ways, the contemporary period already takes those ideas as accepted facts. Contemporary authors use literature to promote ideas and styles that align the Caribbean with other regions or world literatures. In the case of Washington Black, for instance, Edugan borrows tropes from around the world, such as exploitation and identity, and mimics styles from world authors such as Jules Verne, James Joyce, and Toni Morrison. Contemporary Caribbean literature often departs quite a lot from its past through narrative choices that may make you scratch your head at first. How can a novel with only one part set in the Caribbean be a Caribbean novel? Or why can a book in its plot that travels across the globe be about the Caribbean? Well, the simple answer to these questions is this. Contemporary Caribbean literature forces us to examine how and why it departs or aligns with the past traditions, and it makes us concentrate on our interactions with this region. In this presentation, I hope to show you how and why this book matters for Caribbean literature. I hope to give you an overview of the triangle trade and globalization. In the end, Washington Black exemplifies great world literature. S.A. Adugin, while a Canadian writer, writes Washington Black with an authenticity and a commitment to research that makes the novel belong among other great works of contemporary Caribbean literature. The novel has been extremely successful, becoming a bestseller and earning multiple literary award nominations. According to one reviewer, the novel explores power dynamics. Quote, like Adugan's previous novels, Washington Black brings nuance and magnetism to relationships between colonizer and colonized. The journey is by turns tender and cruel, involving patterns of violence, abandonment, of broodedness that create rifts across space, only to have time redraw the bonds. End quote. Adujan has explained that she based the novel on a short story by Argentinian author Jorge Luis Borges, entitled The Improbable Imposter of Tom Castro. Additionally, she finds characters like Washington important to discuss because they belong often to the forgotten stories of history. For this reason and others, President Obama chose Washington Black as one of his favorite books of 2018. Washington Black starts out in Barbados. This presentation, though, will not cover much of Barbadian history as it pertains to slavery. For more information on slavery in Barbados, please watch my video on George Lamings in the Castle of My Skin. In that video, I offer deep demographic and social research about slavery on Barbados. Washington Black reinvents the infamous triangular trade, or the triangle trade, that dominated the Atlantic Basin from around the 1500s to the 1800s. The novel fictionally reverses the flow of people and goods leaving the Caribbean and traveling to Europe and eventually Africa. This illustration above offers a more complete picture of the transatlantic slave trade. Notice how the lines form a triangle shape across the Atlantic. In simpler depictions, the flow of trade resembles an obtuse triangle, with slaves leaving Africa, also known as the Middle Passage, with sugar leaving the Caribbean, and with rum and other goods arriving in Europe. That simplistic explanation, however, does not quite work. Instead, remember the image above. There are a few important details I want to highlight. The export of the enslaved and other natural resources from Africa has a devastating impact on the continent. Additionally, a similar export takes place in the Caribbean. For more enslaved individuals and resources are exported out of the colonies in the West Indies. While those extractions are going, 
The import of alcohol and guns and other materials arrives in Africa to fuel and exacerbate the tensions that started the slave trade. This triangle trade succeeds because of colonization by Europe throughout Africa, the West Indies, and North America. Particularly important is Charleston, South Carolina's place in the system. It is a central point for the import of the enslaved and the export of rice, indigo, and tobacco, the main cash crops of the southern colonies. Before moving on, let's explore the impact this trade had on Africa and its peoples. In his book, How Europe Underveloped Africa, Walter Rodney argues and proves how the West undermined, subjugated, and oppressed Africa and the diaspora for centuries. Like C.L.R. James, Wilson Harris, and Eric Williams, Walter Rodney from Guyana is considered one of the most important Caribbean intellectuals of all time. I'm going to explore Rodney's arguments so you can understand how the triangle trade operated and how it laid the foundation for future exploitation of the Caribbean and Africa. Rodney explains the rules for understanding development. Quote, First, the weaker of the two societies, i.e. the one with less economic capacity, is bound to be adversely affected, and the bigger the gap between the two societies concerned, the more detrimental are the consequences. And second, assuming that the weaker society does survive, then ultimately it can resume its own independent development only if it proceeds to a level higher than that of the economy which had previously dominated it, end quote. While the first rule holds true throughout the Caribbean, the second rule appears to have not become a reality. For more discussion of this situation, please read Jamaica Kincaid's A Small Place and watch my video on that book as well. Rodney's adjective of weaker societies is important to remember because in the eyes of Europe, there was a divine right to control and take ownership of the lands and peoples in the West Indies and Africa. This right, the argument went, belongs to them because of racial superiority. After all, robbing people of their humanity demands racism. Rodney elaborates, quote, The interpretation that underdevelopment is somehow ordained by God is emphasized because of the racist trend in European scholarship. It is in line with racist prejudice to say openly or to imply that their countries are more developed because their people are mainly superior, and the responsibilities for the economic backwardness of Africa lies in the generic backwardness of the race of black Africans. End quote. This racist backward fallacy often gave rise to the concept of paternalism, which makes the colonizer the father and the colonized the child. As we will see, though, the economic interdependency between Europe and Africa drives its ideology. Rodney uses the term economic satellites to describe this relationship. If we return to the map again, we can see how the exporting and importing works. Rodney gives a more robust explanation, quote, Europe exported to Africa goods which were already being produced and used in Europe itself. Dutch linen, Spanish iron, English pewter, Portuguese wines, French brandy, Venetian glass beads, German muskets. Europeans were also able to unload on the African continent goods which had become unsellable in Europe. Thus, items like old sheets, cast-off uniforms, technologically outdated firearms, and lots of odds and ends found guaranteed markets in Africa. End quote. Slavery becomes the most desired commodity, the inhuman price of entry into this global system, which Rodney notes when he writes, quote, The trade in human beings from Africa was a response to external forces. End quote. The West Indies in the system was the most integral part. While John Stuart Mill, the famous British economist, described the Caribbean and the European relationship as one between the country and the town, respectively, the Caribbean's place in this system is invaluable, for it drives and makes the profits for Europe's dominating economic and military growth. For a more in-depth discussion of the economic power and profits of the West Indies, please see my video on Marlon James's The Book of Nightwomen. In that video, I show how the economy of Jamaica worked during this time. Finally, the United States factors into this trade in various ways. 
First, as colonies, they contribute in similar ways, although not as brutally as the West Indies in Africa, giving Europe ready-made markets and natural resources. Then, as an independent nation, the United States relationship changes. Rodney explains, quote, American economic development up to the mid-19th century rested squarely on foreign commerce, of which slavery was a pivot. In the 1830s, slave-grown cotton accounted for half the value of all exports from the United States of America. In New England, trade with Africa, Europe, and the West Indies in slaves and slave-grown products supplied cargo for the merchant marine, stimulated the growth of their shipbuilding industry, built up their towns and their cities, and enabled them to utilize their forests, fisheries, and soil more efficiently. End quote. The wealth generated during this period helped to establish some of the richest families and oldest institutions in our country. By and large, Rodney concludes that, quote, the European slave trade and the overseas trade in general had what are known as multiplier effects on Europe's development in a very positive sense. This means that the benefits of foreign contracts extended to many areas of European life, not directly connected with foreign trade, and the whole society was better equipped for its own internal development. The opposite was true of Africa." End quote. This excursion into the global system, known as the Triangle Trade, lays the foundation for colonization, imperialism, neocolonialism, and globalization in our present state. Rodney sees how this system has had lasting implications in Africa and the Caribbean. From political instabilities and patterns of corruption to neo-colonial control and cultural misappropriation, the West has devastated both the Caribbean and Africa. Quote, the question as to who and what is responsible for African underdevelopment can be answered at two levels. First, the answer is that the operation of the imperialist system bears major responsibility for African economic retardation by draining African wealth and by making it impossible to develop more rapidly the resources of the continent. Second, one has to deal with those who manipulated the system and those who are either agents or unwitting accomplices of the said system. End quote. While it is not a direct corollary to Washington Black, we can see how the colonial system and its agents constantly undermine Washington along his journey. The novel makes us walk along this triangle trade, in a way, and forces us to see the humanity in someone who has been denied his own. While I break down some of the individual estimates by Island in my other YouTube videos, I just want to highlight the chart above. The total amount of enslaved individuals brought into the Caribbean estimates to around 4,221,000. 1,700. This large number was mainly due to the brutal conditions associated with harvesting of sugar. Colonization made it possible for an endless replenishment of enslaved peoples from Africa. That estimate is nearly 10 times the total enslaved individuals brought to the United States as a comparison. The other historical information presented in the novel could be used to develop research topics and other papers. I recommend examining one of these references to explore Washington's relationship to this information. One of the most impressive things about this novel is the vast cast of characters. During this portion of the presentation, I hope to offer some key information and ideas about some of these characters. The Wild Brothers, and eventually the Wild's cousin Philip, are very typical of many plantation owners throughout this time period in the Caribbean. Usually, England's aristocracy, the upper class landed gentry and royalty, would send the oldest child to their colonial properties to learn the ropes. That is, the management of an estate, the economic processes of an enterprise, and the control over lower class workers and subhuman enslaved individuals. You can see this character type both in the works of Austin and Bronte, as well as one of the most important works of Caribbean literature, Wide Sargasso Sea. For discussion of this work, please see my video devoted to it on my YouTube channel. Aside from being typical of this class of people, Yudujan 
uses the wilds to explore the tensions between neoclassicism and romanticism. Indeed, this divide, based on pragmatism and reason on one side, in both Erasmus and his mother, and adventure and passion on the other side, in both Titch and his father, speaks to the turbulent times when the novel takes place. Another tension will appear between Tana and her father and Wash, perhaps based around rom romantic ideals and Victorian sensibilities and expectations. John Willard, if I can briefly explain, represents the middle working class British man at the time, someone who will do anything to get the job done. Although he is Washington's adversary, Willard is not necessarily the enemy. He belongs as a part of a much larger sinister system. Titch's character, though, is the most interesting one to see how he relates to Washington. As in a reader of this novel, I would encourage you to examine this relationship very closely. While an initial reading of his character may reveal our biases about him, we must see the internal complexities and the external forces that influence his behaviors. Try to find evidence on both sides of his character in order to offer a full interpretation of his character. Before moving on to Washington, I would be remiss to ignore Big Kit and her role in this novel. While we learn a major secret about her later in the novel, Big Kit operates as a griot, instilling African myths, culture, and history into Washington. For instance, she embodies the spirit of African power and strength, which Washington recounts early on in the narrative. Quote, she towered over everyone, huge and fierce. Because of her size, and because she was a saltwater, a witch in the old Doame before being taken, she was feared. End quote. Although he cannot confirm these rumors as a child, nor confirm their truth as an adult, Washington has to assume her persona is real. Moreover, she possesses a spirit that demands attention and safety. Again, Washington recalls, quote, in the smoldering fields, she would glisten as if oiled, tearing up the wretched earth, humming strange songs under her breath, her flesh rippling. Some nights in the huts, she would murmur in her sleep in the low, thick language of her kingdom and cry out. No one spoke of that, and in the fields the next day, she would be all scorched fury like a blunt axe, wrecking as much as she reaped." End quote. In many ways, her bluntness and strength fuel Washington along his journey, for she inspires him to never stop seeking his freedom. Washington as the narrator and protagonist is the most important character in the novel. I will leave you to develop your interpretation of his character. I will say, though, that the key to analyzing a main character is to examine key scenes from his early, middle, and later life in the novel. With this strategy in mind, you can see how Washington evolves in this narrative. This slide explains the difference between theme and topic. I will leave it to you to find themes throughout the book. However, I want to touch on one. Washington searches for rootedness in a home. Early in the novel, Washington proclaims that he does not have a homeland. Indeed, this assertion is one of the primary reasons for all the traveling that happens throughout the narrative. Washington's endeavor to make roots and to find out about his ancestry drives the narrative and makes us participants along his journey. At every setting, Washington has moments when he feels at home or among friends, and nearly as many opposite moments when he does not belong. This pull and push informs Washington's development. He ponders at one time about the driving force of his life. Quote, I understood she desired to know if I had found what I was seeking, if this trip would finally satisfy my erratic pursuit of an unanswerable truth, if it would calm my sense of rootlessness, solve the chaos of my origins for me. End quote. Ultimately, it becomes our responsibility as readers and critics to see the answers to Washington's quest. Please use these sources to find more information about the author and the novel.